In this video, I want to introduce what I'll call structural neuroanatomy. Structural, meaning ana the anatomy of the nervous system in terms of what sorts of abnormalities you could see with lesions in different structures of the nervous system. Now an area of abnormality in the nervous system we call a lesion, and the location of the lesion usually determines what sort of syndrome what symptoms or signs occur in regards to what functions of the nervous system are affected. We usually like to divide up the neurological syndromes into those caused by lesions that are focal versus those that are what we call diffuse. So diffuse versus focal lesions causing syndromes related to those diffuse or focal lesions, which we'll often call focal neurological syndromes versus more diffuse neurological syndromes. Now in this context, this word diffuse refers to kind of widespread dysfunction of both sides of a few types of tissues. And in particular, we often use this for when there's kind of dysfunction of the brain that's widespread on both sides, or the nerves kind of most, if not all, of the nerves through the body are dysfunctional, or the muscles, if there's kind of diffuse dysfunction of skeletal muscle throughout the body. We'll often use this word diffuse for those sorts of diffuse lesions or widespread lesions on both sides. Now syndromes involving weakness from diffuse dysfunction of skeletal muscles are usually covered with neurological syndromes, even though skeletal muscle really isn't part of the nervous system. But since weakness is a very common syndrome to occur with lesions of the nervous system, these syndromes from diffuse dysfunction of skeletal muscle are usually covered with neurological syndromes. Now the nerves of the peripheral nervous system are involved in the lower neural functions. So if there is dysfunction of the nerves, it may cause abnormalities of motor, sensory, or autonomic functions, the lower neural functions. If there is diffuse dysfunction of the nerves of the peripheral nervous system, then these abnormalities will usually be widespread and on both sides of the body. But with focal dysfunction of the peripheral nervous system, for instance, just dysfunction of one nerve, then these abnormalities will usually just involve one part of the body on one side, the part that's connected to that nerve. The axons in nerves connect the tissues of the limbs and the torso mainly to the spinal cord here in the spine. And then there are other nerves that connect tissues of the head and the neck mostly to the brain. All of these nerves form pairs on both sides of the body, both the right and the left side, attached to either the spinal cord or to the brain. The nerves that pass through the spine to get out to the periphery of the body from the central nervous system are called spinal nerves. Spinal nerves, because they pass through the spine. The nerves that pass through the skull, which is also called the cranium, are called cranial nerves. Cranial nerves. Now here I've got a little larger outline of the central nervous system. I'll just write CNS for central nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord. That's also over here. The brain inside the head and the spinal cord inside the spine. And the spinal cord is this long thin structure, but it's actually much thicker than any of the nerves. Inside the spinal cord are axons that are connecting all the parts of the spinal cord up to the brain. So there are axons coming down from the brain into the spinal cord and other axons that are heading up from the spinal cord into the brain. And these axons are going to connect to all these other axons that are coming and going from the periphery, bringing information into or out of the central nervous system out into the periphery. And for the spinal cord, that's going to mean connecting to most of the tissues of the limbs and the torso. So that if you get a complete lesion of the spinal cord somewhere, you're going to disconnect all those axons below that lesion from the brain up above. So that all that sensory, motor, and autonomic information traveling in axons in the nerves is not going to be able to connect up to the brain. 
And what we see for a syndrome for that, let's say we have a lesion about halfway up the spinal cord here, is that all the parts of the torso and the limbs below that lesion are going to have abnormalities of sensory, motor, and autonomic functions from information that can't get past that lesion in the spinal cord to connect to the brain up above. Now the brain here is divided into some different parts. So let me just write brain, and we kind of divide it into three main parts that make up the brain. On the top, this biggest part right here is called the cerebrum. Cerebrum. Below that is a structure that connects the spinal cord below to the cerebrum above, and we call this the brain stem. Brain stem. And kind of behind the brain stem here, we can only see part of it, is this other part that we call the cerebellum. 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 The cerebellum does a number of things, but one of the most important things it does is to coordinate movements so that a lesion of the cerebellum may lead to incoordinated movements. Now the brainstem here has axons from the spinal cord traveling up into the cerebrum, carrying information from the limbs and the torso, as well as information from the cerebrum heading down to the spinal cord to head out spinal nerves toward the limbs and the torso. The brainstem also has many of the cranial nerves attached to it, so there's a lot of information from the head and the neck that's passing back and forth into the brainstem through the cranial nerves. So the lesions of the brainstem may cause sensory, motor, or autonomic abnormalities of many parts of the body not only the limbs and the torso but also the head and the neck. And in addition to that there are other parts of the brainstem that have lots of connections to and from the cerebrum, including parts that are involved in the higher neural functions, like cognition, emotion, and consciousness. So that with brainstem lesions, we can not only have abnormalities of the lower neural functions, but we can also have abnormalities of the higher neural functions. Now the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain, and it plays a role in almost all the neural functions, particularly this outermost layer of the cerebrum that's called the cerebral cortex. I'm just going to write that. Cortex. Cerebral or cerebral cortex. And because the cerebrum does so many things, focal lesions of the cerebrum can cause many different patterns of abnormalities. One thing in particular we often see with focal lesions of the cerebrum on just one side of the cerebrum is that we often see motor and sensory abnormalities of the other side of the body or of senses to the other side of the environment, like vision. Because many of these pathways, these motor and sensory pathways, tend to cross at different points in the central nervous system, so that the left side of the cerebrum often controls most of the motor and sensory functions for the right side of the body and the environment. Now we can also see diffuse dysfunction of the cerebrum, particularly the cerebral cortex, and this is a common occurrence which can often affect the higher neural functions, like cognition, while often sparing the, the lower neural functions, like the motor and sensory functions, depending on what parts of the cerebral cortex are involved.